This is Kim Meyer, host of Choose to Rise. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Everybody. Welcome to Beauties and Head Cannons, where we're nerdy, and you probably are too. And welcome to the month of Star Wars. With the new Star Wars movie coming out, we wanted to just take a month and look at all of the Star Wars offerings, especially some of the best of the best. And this week, we're going to be talking about The Mandalorian, the new series by Disney Plus that has kind of been taking the internet by storm, even um, upsetting Stranger Things as the most streamed show uh, available. So um, first, before we get started, I have a little special guest host available. Uh, we have Aurelia, and she is um, not really a huge Star Wars fan, but I think The Mandalorian may just win her over, and she wanted to share her thoughts on it. So go ahead, Aurelia. First of all, I, as she said, I'm not that big of a Star Wars fan, I've never really understood the concept, um, but my mom and my mom's boyfriend wanted to watch it the other night, and they kind of forced me to, (laughs) but at the end of the first episode, we see Baby Yoda, I guess, (laughs) Um, in this little pod, and that night we ended up watching all four episodes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I think is really interesting is that the main character, all we really know are four things. That he's a Mandalorian, and he's a bounty hunter, and that he kind of has a scarred childhood, so therefore he doesn't like drones. Droids. Droids. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, like, he also has a big heart because he goes back and rescues Baby Yoda, which Baby Yoda says adorable. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I guess that's it. Alrighty. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, this is just an indication that if you know, Mandalorian could reach out and appeal to somebody who isn't normally a Star Wars fan, I think that's a really great indicator of just how good this series is in general. Yeah. <laughs> Was there anything else you wanted to say about The Mandalorian? Um, that you should watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully they, um, everybody listening already has watched it um, because uh, this episode is not necessarily going to be spoiler-free. We may be discussing certain things from the episodes um, up for episodes one through four. Um, I think episode five may drop by the time this episode is aired. But um, so epi- all the information for episodes one through four is on the table. We may talk about it. We may not, but just to give y'all... A heads up, if you don't want any spoilers, spoilers. yeah, you, you don't, if you don't want any spoilers, you might want to click away now and come back to it after you're caught up. I did also want to mention, though, to all the listeners that I think it's hilarious. Aurelia not only doesn't like Star Wars, but she vehemently doesn't like Star Wars. So even though I took her to go see The Last Jedi when it was out in the theaters, um, or A Force Awakens, I think it was A Force Awakens, we saw A Force Awakens and she loved Rey. But she was all like, oh, there's never any like powerful female role models, mm-hmm. and I just don't want to watch Star Wars. Uh, it's just a bunch of guys being, um, you know, BA and being awesome and not too many with the girls. 
And uh, we were like, no, that's not true at all. <laughs> if you if you watched any of the old <clears throat> stuff, you would see that there's always a female. Oh that's my gosh, <laughs> kicking butt, and the, kicking names. So, the biggest one in the galaxy, Princess Leia. I know exactly. So it was like, uh, you clearly need to be educated, kiddo. <laughs> and halfway through watching The Mandalorian, she's like, we we got it on recording that she goes. I think maybe I might want to watch the whole timeline of <laughs> everything. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. What did you just say? Hold on. We need to record this. So we totally got a recording of her saying that she might want to watch the whole timeline. Was, that is awesome. It was a monumental <laughs> epic moment. Um, and it's funny because, you know, really is 12. She's not terribly girly girl, not terribly tomboyish. She's run-of-the-mill, nerdy, my daughter etc etc but so cool for her to get so excited about watching this the other night yeah yeah I mean it's really cool to you know just sit back and kind of watch your kids get excited about something you know even though yes. even though Jason's like only three and a half and he can't really talk or communicate well yet I can tell when he's really excited by something yes. and that's when he calms down like we'll, we might be watching like Batman the animated series or something similar um, mm -hmm. Or his dad might be playing uh, some of the Arkham games, and he will just sit down and watch. Yes. And <laughs> that's how we know, like, he loves Batman. In the past, my my first immersion with Star Wars was actually, I had a high school sweetheart who would read um, the, what they're now calling the Expanded Universe. And he would read those books diligently, um, religiously. We would go up north to where there's cabins and woods in northern Wisconsin, <laughs> And he wouldn't be fishing or sitting by the lake or swimming. He would be in the cabin, laying on his stomach, on the queen-size bed that we shared, <laughs> reading whatever book to its completion. And when he ran out of book, we would go to the bookstore and buy another one. That was back when there was a big bookstore up north. So, yeah. I mean, it was, it was a thing. And it was too funny, too, because um, the people I know now who... Um, are talking about the difference between the expanded universe and legends. It's very interesting to me, but it was it was a thing in high school for mm -hmm. us. So I just think it's hilarious because it, it, I was not into it. I didn't understand the difference between X wings and Tie fighters. And even now, sometimes I have to be like, okay, <laughs> the X wings are the rebels. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And then I have to ask friends why they have TIE Fighters on their shirts, that kind of thing. So <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm still learning, but I'm excited to. And that's, that's the difference between me and high mm -hmm. school version me, I suppose. <laughs> okay, so are we talking about, like, our first impressions of Mandalorian? What do we want to delve into first? I mean, I kind of want to touch on a little bit of everything, but definitely first impressions. Because okay. uh, I got to say, I mean, Star Wars is one of the two fandoms that I really actually like started out geeking in. Because um, I watched Star Wars and Star Trek when I was younger. There was no like mm -hmm. battle um, either or for me. I, I liked both of them. And um, so... Growing up, being a really big Star Wars fan, I, you know, constantly was re-watching the original trilogy. I was reading as many of the Expanded Universe books as I could get my hands on. Um, obviously, I was excited and I watched the prequels when they came out, although I was, like, disappointed by them. Um, and, you know, as time went on, I, I kind of became more and more disappointed by what was out there. Um, as far as Star Wars media to consume. There were some bright spots, um, mm -hmm. like the Clone Wars cartoons. That was really good, although I didn't even get to get into them until fairly recently. But by the time, like, Mandalorian uh, started, you know, like, even, like, people even started talking about it, I was just like, oh, I'm just kind of, like, sick of everything that's coming out. It feels like an oversaturation with everything that they sure. were doing. So, like, I didn't read anything about it. I wasn't interested in it when it first came out. And when the episodes first started to post, I, you know, everybody obviously started getting excited about it. And mm -hmm. typical me, I'm kind of like, well, if everybody's excited about it, that probably means I'm not going to like it. <laughs> because I typically don't like what a whole mass of people seem to cling on to. Sure. For better or for worse. And so I still kind of avoided it. And then one evening my husband just decided, you know what? 
I'm going to watch it. So that meant that I was going to watch it too, even mm-hmm. though I was like gaming at the time. And I actually stopped playing my game and mm-hmm. just started watching the episodes with him. And listen to us to stop playing the game. Yes, a thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I mean, that was how I got dragged into the whole thing. Okay. Well, and oh I, of course, you know, I, I guess I'm like a run of the mill kind of person when it comes to Star Wars. I know a little bit, but not a whole lot. I haven't seen any of the cartoons. I know. This month we're going to kind of, um, I don't know if you even said in the beginning of the show, that we're going to be mm-hmm. gearing up for December 20th this entire month. Yep. Um, which means I have to rewatch some stuff. I even had a friend tell me something about the machete version, like watching the, the movies in machete where you get rid of episode one and you yes. watch them in the order that they... Uh, sort of the way they came out using two and three sort of as like flashbacks as opposed yeah. to mm-hmm. so I was like okay sure I'll cut it all up like <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me um, but it's interesting to me about Mandalorian is that I felt like Solo and Rogue One both had that element to them where they were not necessarily to, to the main plot line just like Mandalorian kind of is mm-hmm but this one feels like a better movie to me. Like, I know they're, they're 30 minute shows, but they mm-hmm. feel like, like there's a different element there. And I was yep. trying for a while to figure out what the big difference is because I felt the same way as you do with, with Solo and even sort of with Rogue One. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I was really watching something cohesive to the rest of the storyline. And there was something about the music in Solo that made me, like, cringe. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend who actually said something like, I couldn't tell you what it is that um, bothered me about Solo, but something really bothered me. And I didn't tell him, but I think it it was probably the music, because the music didn't match what was happening Mm -hmm. um, throughout most of the, like, battle sequences and and even real smooth parts of the storyline. They have this, like, real epic music going on and I'd be like what's happening like what am, what am I missing yeah and scores a big thing that's what one of the big things too right scores are so important and the score in Mandalorian makes me want to like buy it mm-hmm. I, I want to listen to it yeah without watching the show and that's a big deal and I didn't feel that way with Solo or with Rogue One mm-hmm. and that and music is a big deal to me so I, I feel like that's something that's really um pressing in this one, especially even like with the concept art that they're showing at the mm-hmm. end of each episode. Oh, I love I that. I want those. I want them printed. I want them on my wall. Mm-hmm. And that's never happened to me before. <laughs> um, I think like a big difference is the way that they're written and the way that they're shot and presented. Um, I mean, obviously you have a lot more flexibility in a TV series than a movie, but at the same time, the writing doesn't have to be so off kilter. So with something like Solo or something like Rogue One or even the recent uh, trilogy movies. Um, You know, just because they're bigger, larger productions, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, you have to be writing all this big, epic stuff that's always going on. Like, I mean, if you if you look back to the original trilogy, their storylines were fairly simplistic And it focused more on the characters and their development, whereas the later movies are focusing more on the events and what's happening around it. And I think that's what makes a big difference is the focal point of a story. You have, in The Mandalorian, you have a bounty hunter who is pretty mysterious, who, you know, we don't know a whole lot about. You have a mysterious 50-year-old baby alien that we don't know a whole lot about, but they're on this journey together and they're encountering these different situations together. And I think that focal point shift is what is really helping Mandalorian appeal much better than some of the other live action offerings. Okay, very cool. Um, So let's talk about the biggest difference that, um, what's her name? Kathleen Kennedy. Yes, uh, let's address that because... Yes, because she said some very 
strange things. And I tried to find the like original article that um, this was quoted in, and I could not find it. I think because like so many p- other like outlets were reporting on it. Um, but if I remember the original one correctly, she had they had been talking about all these rumors about episode nine about how. You know, basically it's kind of a jumbled mess and that they're rushing to finish it and they have like X amount of different endings that they're trying to figure out and go with, which I mean, honestly, this late in production, you should not be at this point. You should not still be cutting together a movie. You should be finished by this point. 18 days. Yeah. Like there is no reason you should be this late into production and you're still putting the movie together. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of figure that's a bit of gross negligence on her, on everybody's part, but, Mm -hmm. you know, Kathleen Kennedy obviously wanted to come out and kind of trying to soothe those fears, but, uh, she didn't really do so because, yeah, because in talking about it, um, she was talking about how, you know, they were putting together the story and she, I guess, was trying to throw shade at, um, the Game of Thrones writers, who probably deserved it, admittedly. And also, like, the writers for the MCU and everything like that saying, oh, well, you know, we're putting together the story basically from scratch. We don't have any source material. We don't have long novels or comic books or anything to draw from. And it's like, yeah, we're just going to ignore this whole expanded universe over here. Right. Full of novels, full of comic books. (laughs) The fact that she said that is so, I mean, uh, rude. I, I've got no better word for it. And, I mean, George Can Lucas... You imagine being one of those writers or being someone like... George Lucas yeah. nodded to the Expanded Universe mm-hmm. before Disney took over. He was yep. like, yes, that's it. Dunzo. And then they come in and they're like, nope, that's not canon anymore. Shut the front door. Uh, Are you kidding? Well, I found that out and I was like, wait a minute. All those books that everybody was reading in high school, you mean that was not canon? Well, I... I know the reason that they made it not canon. I don't necessarily agree with it, but... Okay, what's the reason? Tell me. You know, (laughs) instead of having, like, one or two publishing companies and a handful of authors, there were lots of different companies and lots of different authors that were churning out this content for Lucasfilm. And because of... Can I just interject for a second, though? uh Because that's very much like how the MCU did it. We we did that episode on Stan Lee. We know that comic books were written by tons of different people. I know, but here's the at thing: different times, like uh, okay, I'm I'm, I'm <laughs> mad at Kathleen, not not you. I swear. I know, and and see, the <laughs> thing is, is that those comics are still under Marvel. Marvel still has those rights. The rights for all of the different books are not necessarily all under the same thing. Their different authors may hold different. things. Um, rights come, you know, depending on what they negotiated in their contracts. Different publishing companies might have different things depending on what they negotiated. So, I mean, personally, I think they should have taken the time to negotiate bringing everything in, but they decided not to, and they decided it was too much trouble. And so, what they did instead is one, they um, turned the expanded universe into like the legacy universe or whatever, which I never call it because it's the expanded universe. It always will be the expanded universe for me. Um, And two, they will go out and they will bring in certain things from that expanded universe into canon. Um, The biggest, Mm -hmm. biggest thing obviously was Thrawn when they introduced him in the Star Wars Rebels cartoon and they had Timothy Zahn, his original author, basically write a new novel and new books to reinsert him into canon. And I I know that they have brought different little storylines and things into the canon for various bits of inspiration. So it's, it's not necessarily that it's never going to be canon. It's that basically they can cherry pick now. They can go in and say okay, well, this is a really cool storyline, so let's try and get in contact with these people and get the rights, and we can do this now, as opposed to doing everything beforehand, I guess. But then, doesn't that mean Kathleen's just being ignorant? Yes. Yes, that that is exactly it. (laughs) I mean, 
because they they do have the source material. They have mm-hmm. things they could pick and choose, all these different options, and people who would be more than willing to say, I would love to sit down at coffee with you for a couple hours mm-hmm. and talk about this book I wrote in 2001. Like, <laughs> come on. So yeah. Those comments she made were just rude and ignorant. Yes. Basically, yes. I mean, and every... Star Wars fan who has any inkling of love for the expanded universe has just been raking her over the coals in the internet. And now I'm not going to sit here and say that all of the expanded universe is just the bee's knees and it's the best thing ever and everything. You know, obviously, the expanded universe was basically uh, published fan fiction. And like Mm -hmm. fan fiction, there is good and there is bad. Um, but I mean, the good stuff is so good. And I, I remember reading so much of it growing up and I have so many fond memories of it that, you know, it just seems like such a waste to just throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of, you know, just painting the whole expanded universe as, oh, it's just not even that great. We shouldn't even look at it, you know? Right. What I, what I'm confused about is, you know, in, in the expanded universe, uh, Han and Leia had different kids. Yes. Than they than they do in the movie. Yes. Weren't there like a couple of twins and uh-huh. an Anakin Solo? So how do they explain that from the expanded universe to the? Because do they just coexist? Are they like a nope. parallel universe? Nope. It's basically like. Uh, in fan fiction terms, we call it an alternate universe, canon divergence. Okay. Um, where basically, like, there are different elements that are different, and the alternate universe is not considered canon. So the ca- in the canon universe, you know, Han and Leia just have the one son, Ben. Um, in the expanded universe, they have the twins, Jason and Jaina, and then they have their son, Anakin. And the interesting thing is, is that Jason actually did end up going dark side for a little while. And so I think they were trying to kind of maybe <clears throat> echo that a little bit Definitely. with Ben Solo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but it wasn't really done very well. I thought Jason's was a lot better done. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't watched the last movie um, that's out, and I absolutely hated Kylo Ren. I, I know that there's, like, kids that have tapes and stuff of him, but I can't get over what happened at the end of that movie. I just can't. I, <laughs> dude, Han Solo was my, my dude. <laughs> and I just... I'm sorry. Okay. This episode is about The Mandalorian, yes. not about my love affair with Han Solo. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, Fun fact. Um, <laughs> obviously, we don't know... Mando's face because he never takes his helmet off on mm-hmm. screen at least to where we can see his face but the actor who plays Mando is the oh, same yes. actor who did Oberyn Martell in Game of Thrones yeah. are you going to tell me about the uh, memes? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh and I you know like every time like I see him on screen I have such a hard time, like, not picturing over and underneath all of that. Like, especially in one of the episodes when he goes up against that big beast. Mm -hmm. Like, I kept getting, like, you know, the viper versus the mountain. Yep, yep. And I'm like, oh god, I hope this isn't like a (laughs) first. Well, and you know, it's funny because I've been watching him walk and I'm like, he even walks like over. Yeah. Wow, this is... I'm I'm having trouble. Like, like, um... (laughs) I didn't really realize it was him until maybe the second or second episode or so, and not because I saw his name in the screen either. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, they, they're disguising voices really well. Um, yeah, like voice wise, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> did you did you hear John Favreau do the um, Mandalorian that was in the armory? Um, I heard him. Yeah, but like I didn't yeah. know it was him. Right. And of course, I was watching it with someone who's really good with voices, so he was mm-hmm. instantaneously like, oh, yeah. it's John Favreau, and I was like, stop it. <laughs> and he was like, no, and he's looking it up on IMTV, sure enough, that's who it was, and I'm like, oh, goodness. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Um, so, I did want to quickly talk about my Geek on Fleek uh, idea, um, of talking about John Favreau and everything that was going on. <laughs> um, it was interesting to me to find out that the... Um, group of 
uh, fans who make stormtrooper costumes, um, like canon accurate. Um, movie accurate costumes, the 501st, um, mm-hmm. also known as uh, Darth's Fist. They have like 13,000 members, and if you look them up online, they actually have their own website that, that's like 501st.com. Um, mm-hmm. And I've been told it's actually 501st, not 501st, even mm-hmm. though they're both correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they actually got to feature in The Mandalorian because John Favreau realized they only had so many. Um, stormtrooper costumes so they called out to them and were able to rally up quite a few and have them featured in some of the shows I don't know which mm-hmm. one um, I'm kind of hoping that that many stormtroopers haven't shown up yet because I mm-hmm. feel like we haven't seen a whole lot um, but this is the first time I've actually seen like almost sand troopers and stuff too so yeah. I don't know I'm, I'm really excited that 501st, actually, um, their, like, bread and butter is the Stormtroopers, but they also have um, a group that are doing the, the, like, Mandalorian costumes and stuff, too. So I almost sort of hoped that when, one episode, when you see the other Mandalorians come in Mm -hmm. um, to come to his rescue when he's uh, getting Baby Yoda (laughs) out... I was kind of hoping some of them were them, too, because that was an epic moment. Oh, yeah. Um, those jetpacks, man. Yes. Uh, someone had told me, oh, that Mandalorians with a jetpack are, Mm -hmm. are a weapon. Oh, yes. Does that come up in like a, a, one of the cartoons or something? I don't know. I just thought it was so cool. I was was so excited to see all of them swoop in and I was Oh, it's amazing. What was so cool was that he had just gotten that armor. It was super shiny. It was going to draw attention. He, you know, was under scrutiny, and then they all come swooping in for this, mm-hmm. like, he's going to go rescue the the target and save it from whatever fate it's going to go get against the guild's code. Like, stop it. I was <laughs> I was so in love with him from that moment, if I hadn't already been at that time. Yeah. So, and, and everybody else with the jetpacks. Oh, oh yes. And, I mean, that is, like, a really awesome, like, marriage of art between, like, you know, fans and filmmakers where, you know, a filmmaker recognizes that, hey, you know, we do have a deficiency and we have dedicated fans who are more than able and willing to help us out. So, you know, I I just think it's an awesome testament to, you know, how good a product can be if we all just work together on it. Yes. Those guys are awesome, guys and girls. They um, have done tons of charity work for Make a Wish and all sorts of other programs. Um, raised tons of money, and it's just so cool to not only see them giving back, but also, you know, even though a lot of their costumes were, um, and they they strive on making them canon specific, canon specific. Mm-hmm. Um, now you know that they've shown up in the films, they are canon. Like mm-hmm. that is awesome yeah um because you know i i've never even seen any discrepancies in a stormtrooper costume but if there Mm -hmm. were that's just that just makes it that much better yeah um but i'm just totally geeking out hard on these guys (laughs) because super cool that they um devote their time to doing this thing and to also the, the the amounts of charity that they've done is just commendable i wish i was so cool and that's really all I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was something else I wanted to talk about there too, that had to do with oh, so I kind of geeked out a little bit about John Favreau. Um, mm-hmm. He's been showing up doing a lot of stuff lately, um, between Lion King uh, live action and being happy in Iron Man. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm feeling like he's gotta live up the street from a Disney headquarters or something um I just feel like it'd be cool to have coffee with him yeah yeah um and just uh one more thing like going back to the point of like fans and you know producers and stuff I just wanted to go back for just one second because you know my ADHD brain likes to come up with things after the fact sure (laughs) um you know, I, I feel like some sometimes these days, like, you know, producers and studios are very, like, possessive of, you know, their their fandoms, the, you know, products that they put out. And so much so that, like, you know, 
it seems like they don't even want to listen to fans all that much. Um, but I mean, I at least hope, hope that, you know, the cooperation between the 501st and, you know, everybody involved with the Mandalorian can, you know, kind of show that fans and studios and producers, you know, we can all coexist together. And this fandom, this thing that we love, it's not just, it doesn't just belong to one person. It belongs to all of us. I mean, obviously, obviously certain people are going to make profits off of it, but it's for everybody. That's what I think is so interesting about the Kathleen Kennedy thing too, is that Mm -hmm. it seems very, um, very, there's a big disparity there between her comments about um, the source material and um, John Favreau going out and being like, "Let's mm-hmm. let's get these guys in here." And yeah, and she seems film. like she seems very "it's my way or the highway" she's kind of not, thing. Not in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's where I was going with that for sure. Just yeah. you know the the difference between um, in knowing that you have a wellspring of people that want to see this do well mm-hmm. um, versus thinking that you're an island. There's so much to do and so much that can go on, and I'm almost like scared to hear you say that about the <laughs> film coming out this month because yeah, gosh, I hope that they hit it and hit it hard. Um, uh, I have a bad feeling. <laughs> I know people who have been really disappointed mm-hmm. in stuff lately, and there's always sort of a a weird nostalgic thing going on when they take something that we grew up with and they have to make it for an audience that's different than we were but also very much the same. I've been reading a lot lately about um, you know children still wanting to interact with a television or media personality in the way that they know that they like kids and they know that they reach out to their fan base or children in any way shape or form and Uh all of us now at this point are we're all children we all want to be reached out to Uh but we're also able to contribute to the story too and I think it's like gosh they uh, there's always so much writing on something like this you know we we were so worried with the MCU as well yeah Um, um, I was always pleasantly surprised with whatever came out so I'm kind of hoping in the next month or so, oh, the next couple weeks, I'm going to delve myself into the lore <laughs> and um, the books that are out there. So I'm going to try and read up on Tatooine and <laughs> maybe I'll fashion myself an Ewok and all kinds of cool stuff. Cause, I mean, Elizabeth, I've been wanting an Ewok since I was like 12, for sure. I don't know how I'm going to get myself one because I can't <laughs> go to Endor, but Endor's gone. So... <laughs> But yeah, and it, it, I, 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 I uh. you're never at a loss for words. No, it, it's, I, I just get tongue tied. And <laughs> because the thing is, I don't think any fan goes into something wanting it to go badly. Right. You know, we want, we go into it wanting it to be good. You know, every nice. movie I've, you know, go and watch. I want it to be good. I don't want to sit there and intentionally watch what I objectively think is a bad movie. Mm-hmm. You know, I go in there and I'm like, okay, I hope it's going to be good. And sometimes it is good and sometimes it's not good. And if it's, you know, I, I, I mean, I get my thoughts on it either way. But, you know, I, I do kind of take a little bit of umbrage with certain, a little bit more toxic parts of the fandom who... Mm-hmm who think that, you know, you just have to love everything that comes out. And if you don't love everything that comes out, then you're not a real fan. And, you know, oh, well, you know, oh, well, you're expecting it to be bad, so then, of course, it's going to be bad for you. Like, you know, you got to go, you know, positive mindset and everything like that. And, like, you know, I've always thought it's a mark of maturity to be able to look at something you love objectively and to be able to look at the things that are not good with it and acknowledge that and the fact that you still love it in spite of those flaws you know I think means that you are a good fan you know because you know despite everything that's been going on with the latest seasons of Supernatural which I've not even been watching because I 
think and feel and I hear it's a dumpster fire. You know, I still love the series itself. I still love the world. I still love the characters. And in spite of all of those missteps and all of those, you know, uh, writing issues, I still love it. And I, I just don't love the recent seasons, but I still love the fandom in general. And, right, and it's definitely, it, I agree with you, it's definitely mm-hmm. a mark of maturity to be able to say, I, I know that this is mine and I love it, mm-hmm. but I can also appreciate the ways things are done differently in different parts of the seasons. So. Mm-hmm. And she got kicked again. All right, so why don't you tell me about Gaming Corner? All righty. Well, Gaming Corner this week, um, I got to dive into Obsidian's, probably their most famous uh, RPG that they've put out, um, which is Fallout New Vegas. Um, The other month, I did get to play uh, The Outer Worlds, which is the newest RPG that they've put out, and along uh, along with that, I was able to get... Um, New Vegas along with the uh, Game Pass. So uh, I finished The Outer Worlds and then I started like diving into New Vegas and it was such an interesting comparison not only to play um, a Fallout game that wasn't Bethesda because I've played 3 and 4 which are both done by Bethesda but to play one that isn't done by Bethesda and also just an Obsidian RPG in general I, I thought it was really, really interesting to see all of the kind of similarities and comparisons between The Outer Worlds and Fallout New Vegas. And not just, you know, uh, you know the obvious ones that people will draw on, like, oh, it's kind of dystopian, and oh, it's got all this retro vibe to it, and all this stuff. Like, no, like, the way that you play, like, and, like, the different armors, the different factions, and how that they're all tied together, and if you put on the armor of one faction, it will, you know change how people perceive you and everything like that's you know something you can find in both and like just all kinds of these little elements like that are in both games and it's kind of interesting to see because you know obviously New Vegas has come out years ago and The Outer Worlds is recent and you know even though I wouldn't say that The Outer Worlds is antiquated what it's more of like they're they're taking like the foundations of what works in a really good RPG and they're just continuing that tradition. And I I mean, I was really pleasantly surprised and pleased to see that, you know, Obsidian is kind of remaining true to its roots. Um, Because a little fun fact, I mean, Fallout was originally done by Black Isle, who went under and the rights to Fallout was sold to Bethesda. But Mm -hmm. uh, the people who comprise like the main core of Black Isle created Obsidian. And so Obsidian is kind of seen as like the spiritual successor to Black Isle as far as, you know, the games that they put out and kind of like the canons and the worlds that they work with. So uh, it, it was really great. It was a really awesome experience to be able to play in a world that I know and that I'm familiar with, but to play it a little bit differently from... Mm-hmm kind of a different perspective I wouldn't say that I love it more than three or four I I would say I love it equally because like there's obviously things in all the games that I love more than the others and then there's things that I don't like more than the others so I I kind of classify it as I I just kind of love them all equally and I love them all for different reasons so uh, if anybody does get the chance if they want to check out uh, Fallout New Vegas it is still um, under the Xbox Game Pass, so if and I believe they might still be running a promotion for it for a dollar a month. So I mean, definitely check it out. I mean, you get access to a bunch of games for like a dollar a month, and you can play it as much as you want. So there that we go. Like a really good deal. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh and yeah. Hashtag not sponsored at all. Right. <laughs> not sponsored. Yes. Um. So that's all I wanted to talk about with Mandalorian. I. Wanted to also mention we are going to be talking about Star Wars all month long. Um, We've got a couple of different ideas that we've been bouncing around for the past couple of months that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But we would love to hear your suggestions as to what you'd like to hear us talk about. If you've got a order of the movies you'd like me to make a value (laughs) watch them in, I would be so for um, telling her that a 
listener said she needs to watch them in this order. <laughs> um, I have a best friend and all kinds of awesome, cool people in my back pocket that have opinions about these kinds of things. <laughs> Not so, just me. <laughs> I'm super excited, right? Not just, not just Elizabeth. Um, so I'm super excited to kind of delve into the universe and, um, you know, watch the cartoons that are on Disney Plus. Something I've never been able to do before, <laughs> as well as um, go back and watch all the movies too, and things that I missed when I was 12, trying to figure out the difference between X Wings and Tie Fighters, and <laughs> asking, you know a eight-year-old to explain them to me and who's fighting who and why is this rebel one and who's this guy and what's going on (laughs) so you know being 34 i should be able to have a slightly better grasp on it Uh, (laughs) hopefully hopefully and hopefully i'll be able to teach a rally a few things but that also could depend on you if you can teach me a few things maybe we can all get it together and uh, by the end of the month you know uh, be in a universe far, far away. Yes. Um, that being said, please, please uh, comment and talk to us on all of our social media. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I'm sure there's something else out Tumblr. there. Tumblr. Tumblr. <laughs> um, it is Beauties and Head Cannons. And with that, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Elizabeth. And thanks for getting nerdy with us today on Beauties and Head Cannons.